Thank you for your cooperation. Ladies and gentlemen, the event will begin shortly. Can we please ask for you to kindly take your seats? We would like to remind you again to switch off all mobile phones and put electronic devices to silent mode. Thank you for your cooperation. 有请主持人上场 I would like to invite the moderator to go on the stage 谢谢了, Distinguished guest, good evening Welcome to attend the 2022 Financial Street Forum Parallel Forum on Financial Development and Financial Security under Global Geoeconomic Exchange. Tsinghua PBCSF is the uh, organizer and uh, also sponsored the, uh, this forum. And please allow me to introduce the VIP guests who present here today. Mr. Xiao Gang, member of the National Committee of uh, Chinese People's Political Consultative Conference, former chairman of China Security Regulator Commission. conflict has imposed uh, the various uncertainties to uh, to our to our world and there are some uh, insecure unstable and uncertain uncertainties emerged significantly and uh, we also experienced the uh, reoccurrences of the uh, pandemics and uh, 
the security is very, very important for the financial industry, also for, for our state. So financial security is um, fundamental to ensure the security of our nation. So how to maintain the balance between financial security and how to achieve the sustainable development for finance industry are the main topic for us tonight. And uh, I would like to give the floor to Mr. Xiao Gang, member of the National Committee of the Chinese People Political Consulting Conference, former chairman of the China Security Regulator Commission, to address to us. Mr. Xiao Gang, you have the floor. Distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen, good evening. It's my pleasure to attend 2022 Financial Street Forum. And uh, tonight's uh, parallel forum is very relevant. And uh, today's forum is about financial security and financial development. And uh, I would like to discuss a topic and to talk about the, how to set up a uh, secure governance system. And uh, in the uh, report issued during the uh, 20th National Congress, it states the very important issues in regards of the financial risk and how to prevent the uh, financial risk. And that there are several issues needs to be solved. And. Uh, in the report, it focuses on the financial risk and how to build a modernized central bank system and how to complete the financial supervision and also strengthen the security system for finance. And at the same time, to include all the financial activities to a legal systems and to prevent the system systematic risk from happening. So it can be seen that in the National Congress, the, the, the country really attached a greater importance on financial securities. So guided by the central government, uh, and we can summarize it into four aspects. The first is to stabilize the situation. Second is uh, coordination and synchronization. And the third is classification. And uh, the last one is the precise debugging. And uh, we have achieved uh, remarkable achievements. And uh, from 2020 to 2021, and from uh, 2017 to 2022, and the, uh, the banks Ha, uh, the banks have uh, re resolved the over 1.2 billion yuan uh, that the, uh, the, the the bad debt, the bad assets, and also stabilize the risk for the med medium and uh, small financial risks. And uh, this is a called a precess debugging, and. Uh, we solve the issue, but at the same time, we stabilize the, the general development of a banking system. And the third one is to reduce the shadow banking risk. Now, before 2018, before issuing the uh, related government uh, uh, governance, there are a lot of uh, shadow bankings, and uh, the, the amount was uh, was huge. So after 2018, and uh, we gradually mitigated this risk uh, for the past uh, several years. And uh, I think the shadow banking's risk was under control. And the third one is to, to work with the uh, internet financial risk. And I believe that uh, the, there are some leftover issues, but uh, I think generally speaking, the uh, internet financial risk is managed properly. And the last one is we maintain the stability of a financial markets. And um, no matter if it's a stock a security or, or the bond, there, there are some uh, fluctuations. 
but uh, I think we have uh, taken uh, very quick and responsive actions to deal with the uncertainties and uh, the um, unsecured issues. And for the systematic risk, there are some features. I believe that you are familiar with these uh, features. The first is uh, it's invisible. It's very invisible, and it, uh, they are hidden in some some area because there are complex reasons and factors that uh, that form in the systematic risk, and uh, it takes a longer time to form the systematic risk. And uh, some of the policies or regulations will lead to a greater risk. Or uh, what does it mean? It means that uh, some policies that facilitated some uh, consumption or uh, facilitates the development of financial industries, but uh, with these benefits and, uh, and advantages, there are some uh, neglected areas, and the risk has been piled up. And uh, the last, uh, the the next one is a uh, higher debt uh, leverage ratio, and also the pressing of the risk is not precise. Some of the risks are very difficult to identify, and uh, the systematic. This, so this is the first feature of the systematic risk, and the second risk is it it can all break. Suddenly, because the uh, the outbreak is not linear, and uh, when it explodes, it it will come in a very large scale, and uh, it affects quickly, and uh, we all uh, call it a butterfly effects, and uh, it affects uh, a lot of area, a lot of industries, and uh, people seems feel like that the uh, fluctuation were. The uh, the radiation of a butterfly is minimized, but uh, it can trigger a lot of uh, infection and uh, fluctuation to the market, and um, you will feel that the market has already lost its control, and it's very very it's very hard to predict. The stability of the market is uh, uh, is uh, devastated. So this is why we say the systematic risk is very difficult to predict. And there are a lot of literature talk about this. So this is a second feature. And the third feature is disruptive. I think you can easily tell this definition from the name. And because it brought, it brought the long-term and the severe impact to the financial systems. From the past financial crisis, the, um, the all the effects are long term, and it takes a longer time to solve this issue. For for example, in 2008, I think there's still some lingering effects of, from the financial crisis in 2008. So for China, it's very important to build a comprehensive governance system for financial industries. So the first is from the angle of uh, the state security, because it is a change unseen for 100 years. And it, it brings a lot of challenges, but at the same time, it brings a lot of opportunities. So how to coordinate the development with security, how to synchronize the development is a very crucial issue for us. So financial security is part of the uh, state security. I think financial security is the precondition for achieving state securities. And the second is this is an uh, important stage for achieving the high quality development. So economy is our body and muscle, and uh, finance is like our blood vessel. Uh, so this is a, a very important precondition for achieving the modern, modern China. And uh, we have to say that if the finance is active, our economy is vital, and the present C has mentioned about this in various, condition, various situations. And uh, if the finance is stable and the whole economy is stable, and at the same time, so we should increase the compat compatibility of the finance industry, also increase the uh, inclusiveness of the finance industry. 
the competitiveness of the finance industry should also be increased. And the last one is how to build a modern financial system. And the, the financial risk is inherited. And there are some inherited hidden risks. Because uh, fin if you work in finance industry, basically your life, your work is to deal with risk. So manage risk is um, is vital line to ensure a good quality, healthy quality growth of a finance industry. So risk is uh, something that we cannot uh, avoid to talk about. So bringing the financial security to a, stra a, stra a strategy level is very important. And, uh, and if we want to step to the advanced economy, steps is very difficult. And, uh, there, and over 30 economies, they are already in the uh, advanced economy hurdles. And uh, some of the country, they have already get into the threshold of advanced economies, but with some turbulence and, uh, and effects and factors, they gradually they gradually down to the uh, uh, middle, middle income countries. So I would like to raise several examples, take South Korea, Argentina, uh, Latvia, and Hungary, for example, and, and Russia, for example. Uh, actually, all these countries have have stepped into the uh, advanced economy threshold. But in 1998, you can see that they come back to the, uh, the middle income uh, economies circle. And in 2001, and they back to the uh, high advanced economy circle again. And take Russia, for example, in 2012, they, they are included in the advanced economies and back to the middle, middle income economies in 2015. And now they, 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 they fail to step into the uh, advanced economies circle. And uh, some of them are affected by financial crisis or Asian financial crisis. Therefore, maintaining these financial security systems is really important. And how can we improve or how can we make a sound improvement to the system? Here I want to mention several points. The first one is that we need to enhance these comprehensive and centralized leadership of the CPC. That is, we should stick to like the policy-based development, uh, like, like the politics-based development for the financial sector, and also this organic uh, integration of a, these a kind of market-based and professional-based. And at the same time, we know that we should not only serve for like the whole political body, but also for our people. And at the same time, financial system is actually another system that is kind of modernized a market-based system. That is why it should also follow its market-based development patterns and the development characteristics. And a, it is also a kind of a pretty much a professional market. That is why we should respect these kind of professional features of this financial sector. That is why we need to have this kind of organic integration of all these different factors. And that is also we need to stick to the systematic ideas and also this question or problem orientation and to fully implement this liability system. So under the leadership of the CPC, how can we motivate the central government and the local government? And how can we better improve this financial government and management mechanism? And all these questions still need to be explored in the future. And I think that is one of the most important part. The second is to maintain the quality improvement of the economy and also this reasonable growth for the number and amount. And we know that a, these kind of prevention and mitigation of the financial risk can only be achieved during the process for development. And that is why it should be based on development and to be more specific, a high quality development. So the thing is, if we want to promote the quality development and the proper growth for a month, we need to properly enlarge our domestic demand. And we should have a proper connection between enlarging the domestic demand with the supply side structure reform. 
and to build up this kind of high quality and high level market based economy so that the market economy will be more effective and these mi microeconomic entities will be more vital and will be have more vitality and also this kind of macroeconomic regulation should also be more effective we should not only enhance this kind of counter cycle uh, regulation but also this inter cycle uh, regulation and to better con connect the two so only by properly develop our economy can we properly mitigate and prevent these systematic risks. The third is to uh, do a good job in improving these kind of rule by law system. So for our financial system, we should uh, accelerate in the enacting and also in the launching for the law for financial stability. And the reason for that is that we know many laws and regulations in China have already touched uh, some of the regulations in prevention and control for the financial risks. But such risks are pretty much separated, and they are separated in different laws. So by combining them into one specific law called the Law for Financial, Secu uh, financial Stability will be pretty much helpful for the top-notch design, and so that we can better integrate and improve the level for existing laws and regulations. And more importantly, we can generate a kind of long-term mechanism that we can use to mitigate and prevent these financial risks. So we believe that uh, these, the law for financial stability can be seen as a basic law or the fundamental law for financial risks, and which is helpful for improve the systematic control and prevention abilities and to stabilize the guarantee system. And the, net, the last point is about do a good job in building up this financial security website web in the past when we talk about it we have three traditional tools the first one is the prudent governance from the microeconomic point of view the second is the deposit insurance and the third is right the ultimate lenders for the central bank but right now we believe that these three are far from enough and we should build up new pillars. The first one is the prudent policies from the micro, from the macroeconomic point of view. The CPC Central Committee have already proposed that we should build up this dual pillar system. And uh, focusing on the, the, the dual pillar system, and we have also uh, looked into multiple aspects for the reformation. That is, how can we properly define the governance structure? And another thing is that what is the ultimate target for our prudent policy? And we know that uh, for our ultimate target, uh, for the target for like the currencies and also for money is to stabilize the prices and to help with the growth. But the ultimate target, right, is to right is still waiting for further exploration. And how can we properly uh, divide or distribute those rights and liabilities? Because we have the central government, we have these governance agencies, and also the central financial governance agencies and institutions, right? And how can we build up this kind of early warning system and also the early correction mechanism? All these things need to be explored. And also we have, a, we need to look at these enriching and other development for this policy toolbox that we need to develop the tools from the capital, assets, and the liquidity point of view. The second is to enhance these governance in functions and behaviors. That is to enhance this kind of overall regulation and coordination and to prevent kind of overlapping or uh, the, the blank spaces. And the second is to build up and to improve this kind of financial security governance system or supervision mechanism for the cross-border capital flow. And the second and the third is these financial asset security and the third is the technology for governance and supervision. With the continuous development for fine tech, right, we know that uh, the business system have already changed largely. And it is far from enough if we only depend on our manual governance. And we need to have like the data-driven and also the science and technology empowered mechanisms for conducting these governance. And I think that is all for my sharing. Thank you very much. So thank you very much for your excellent speech. And the next, let's have the speech from Mr. Liu Shun. Let's welcome him to come to the stage.
Liu Shengda is the former chairman of the Supervisory Committee of the State-Owned Asset Supervision and Administration Commission of the State Council. And Honorable Chairman Mr. Xiao and the third delegates. Good, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, sorry, good evening, everyone. I'm really glad to stand here. In two decades ago, I come to the, the financial street from Fujian province. And today, in this unique time, I've been to the financial street once again. And I've participated in the opening ceremony in the afternoon, and I have just heard the excellent speech given by Mr. Xiao. And before my speech, I'd like to share two events to all of you. The first thing is that and the central government have been, importantly, uh, have been largely promoting these kind of, uh, these protection of the blue sky. And that is the first, uh, that is the first targeted fight. And I believe that we have, we everyone have expressed uh, or have experienced the achievements. Well, the second is called the poverty alleviation. And I believe that we have also expressed and have experienced the achievements for that. The third of the tough fight is to mitigate and prevent the systematic risk for the financial sector. And we are still waiting to see the outcome. That is because the central government have for a long time uh, put the financial risks as a kind of Democles sword that is high above every one of us. And another thing I'd like to share with all of you, that is we will have a kind of a uh, we will have a these prizes for uh, this uh, system. And the first one is that they will have changed, uh, they will have uh, the, the kind of basic change from the systematic in entity to this mechanism entity. And the second change is from the devices entity to the information entity. And the, sy the system entity and this device entity are closely separated and closely distinguished in their aspects. And what are the distinguish? And also, the key word for today's forum is governance. And actually, as early as the year 2013 and 2019, the CPC have clearly proposed that we need to carry out the in-depth ref reform. And the target for our in-depth reform is to continuously improve this kind of a socialist mechanism with Chinese characteristics and also to promote the modernization for the governance system. And so what is modernization and what is governance system right, or governance mechanism? That is the key. And among all these uh, world-class enterprises, and the enterprises have clearly proposed that they need to a, they need to have a modern governance. They need to have the excellent products, and for these kind of, and also for our electricity market, and that is we need to build up this kind of unified, open, competitive, orderly, safe, and high efficient market with a complete or improved governance. So, what is governance? What is complete? What is governance, and what is the system? And also another question: What is modernization? So today's co-host, we have a this Tsinghua University, the PBCSF here, and I think that is why we should properly answer all those questions. So the organizing committee uh, asked me to pro to provide an outline for my speech, and I have provided one speech, a uh, one outline called to. Uh, to promote uh, our growth with the development of the efficiency for the system. So in a, when a Chairman Xi is participating in the discussion for the Guangxi delegates, he proposed that we need to properly build up this mechanism. And he have also promoted the idea that we should centralize and also to integrate our forces to work harder. And the key to him and, and the key to the central government that is we should a join our forces and to generate this kind of solidarity so what is our target what is the hard target for development so if it is everywhere then we are out of focus so right now we are actually facing this kind of situation that a the chairman has a stated 
in his uh, during his visit with a German uh, the German Premier. There are actually uh, two situations. The first one is changes, and the second one is uh, a great opportunity. So we have discovered a great opportunity in the cha in this kind of changing era, and we have think. Uh, and from my, my thinking, that is our greatest advantage. That is, we have a close connection between the theory and the practice. And our largest pra uh, crisis comes from the separation between the theory and the practice. We know that uh, by promoting our actual practice and by go down to the earth, can we better develop. So to join our effort and join our forces means that we should set up our view and to work together. And there was one famous a Chinese ancient poet and Chinese ancient monk has mentioned that for one thing, if that is true, we can do that for multiple times. So the thing is that if we can generate or form into a joint force, then can we have a better effect? So before this 19th CPC National Congress, and the chairman have clearly quoted one sentence from Angus, saying that the whole worldview of Marxism is not something that is that is fixed. It is not providing the answer, but out, and the thing is that it provides the kind of methodology and a start point for our future research. And I think this is the thing that we need to look into after the 20th National Congress. And so after the 20th CPC National Congress, we have been looking into the problems for the boats, the ships, and the bridges. And I think we should uh, together study two articles together. The first one is and the article written by Chairman Mao in 1934 and entitled Take Good Care of People's Living and to Pay Attention to the Method of Work. And he is actually a role model for combining this Marxism with the traditional Chinese culture. And, and if we want to look, go back into the spirits of the CPC, that is, we should trace back to the Region Conference and to seek practicality and to work for, this, for the people to thereby create a kind of world class situation. So basically, if we look into the, uh, the paper of or the article for Chairman Mao, then we will know that one, why we can ultimately succeed. So uh, if we say that uh, the changes or the situation that we are facing are not as much or as severe as uh, in this kind of uh, reformation. And the second is that if we don't know, if we only memorize some kind of conclusions or some principles, then if we cannot have a clear understanding of that, then I think if we cannot properly know about that we are changing from our energy center to this kind of efficiency for the mechanism, I think then we cannot have and properly grasp these ideas. And I hope that everyone can have a clear understanding of all these ideas and how can we join our forces. We should act to achieve the dual carbon objectives. And secondly, we're going to facilitate and land the uh, the projects of uh, carbon peak and uh, carbon neutrality and uh, accelerate the uh, usage of uh, green energy and at the same time to increase deployments of uh, new energy and clean energies. and actively to join the mechanisms of climate change to battling the uh, climate change. And uh, I think we are experiencing the, trans the uh, revolution of consumption because I used to work in energy industry. And uh, I think we should learn the spirit from a presidency And the second sentence is to turn our focus on the real economy. 
and uh, facilitate the uh, development of uh, new industries and uh, make the uh, manufacturing China strong and build a strong aviation industries, strong real economies. So what is uh, digital China? And in 2000, year of 2000, the uh, digital Fujian was proposed. And uh, several years ago, digital China was proposed. It's not only about uh, digital economies. And uh, in, in the year of 2000, I proposed uh, the digital Fujian. And uh, Zhang Junzheng, in 1,500 years, and uh, he proposed uh, the similar idea. So we well, actually we should learn from our um, ancestors, because we are in we are the fortune to live and work with five uh, Gs. And the third sentence is also stated in the uh, party articles. We should place technology as the first driving force. And, and we should focus on the cultivation of talents. And uh, we should make use of technologies. And the talents is our primary resources. And uh, innovation, innovation leads the uh, development, also drives the developments. And uh, the important idea here is we should rely on the advanced technologies. Also, we should improve the uh, quality of our talents to achieve the uh, high efficient, high quality, and sustainable development. To achieve that, the security is vital. And uh, we should improve the uh, efficiency of the machine and to balance the uh, development of uh, people and, uh, and uh, machines. I think this has been achieved 20 years ago. And if we don't insist on this road, going on this road is very, is, is very difficult for us to achieve modern developments. Thank you, President Liu. Thank you for your amazing speech. Next, I will give a floor to Mr. Li Jun. Vice President of Export and Import Bank of China. Distinguished uh, President Xiao, distinguished uh, President Liu, ladies and gentlemen, Dear leaders, good evening. It's my pleasure to attend Financial Street Forum. And um, today's session is about the uh, financial development and financial security under global geoeconomic change. And I would like to share with you of my ideas. And uh, from I personally I benefit a lot from uh, Mr. Xiao and Mr. Liu's presentation. And uh, at the present, there are changes unseen in the hundred years. There are a lot of uncertainties and unsecured issues, and the uh, international economy's order has has adjusted. And uh, from the uh, uh, geopolitical angle, there are some uh, conflicts and turbulences, and the international uh, circumstances has become more complex. Complex, and. Um, from the economy angle, uh, there's some uh, energy crisis and a short of uh, short of a food supply, and uh, for some of the countries suffer from very high inflation, and uh, or we a challenge is to waste the financial headwinds. From the financial security angle, the um, 
there are some uh, hidden uh, risks. And then there are numbers of uh, black swan and uh, gray um, uh, rhinos events. And uh, the financial stability has been challenged a lot. And uh, there are several phenomena. The first is the recovery and the development of a trade and investment face challenges. Affected by the uh, geopolitical conflicts between Russia and uh, Ukraine, the international trade and investment have not fully recovered from pandemic. And the supply chain of the global industrial, industrial chain has not yet been fully opened up. And uh, the trade and investment is under great downward pressure. According to the uh, World Trade Organization, the growth rate of uh, global trade increased by 3.5% and uh, down by 6.2%. And um, the um, the growth rate will further decline next year, and uh, we can barely maintain a positive growth. And uh, I think the uh, the pressure on the global supply chain has eased, but the resilience is uh, still insufficient. And the uh, second is the uh, challenges from uh, energy crisis and uh, the green uh, transformation, energy transformation, uh, be, uh, with the outbreak of uh, uh, Russia-Ukraine conflicts. Many countries has suffered from energy supply and rising energy prices, and a lot of countries have to restart the coal power, and the pace of carbon emission reducted, uh, reduced, and uh, energy is a very important issue for maintaining the state securities. And from the medium to long-term growth, the uh, green low carbon is not contra contradictory to energy securities. Only through technology optimization, transformation, and upgrading, accelerating the efficiency of resources use and reducing the dependence on traditional energy can achieve the energy security. And the third one is the challenges for financial securities. The inflation has been very high for the advanced economies. And many developing economies has significantly adjusted their macro policies. And a lot of countries increased their interest rate. Uh, Fed Reserve and the European Central Bank have raised uh, their interest rate by 375 and 200 basis points. The, there is unprecedented tightening, uh, tightening of um, monetary policy. And the, the effects of interest rate on inflation control is not effective. And uh, and the, uh, the, the exchange rate to dollar has a sword, and the euro and the yen and the sterling have dropped to have dropped for uh, to the uh, decades records, and a lot of country were trapped into the debt difficulties, and the f uh, the fourth one is the uh, the the free flow of the capital is challenges the. Uh, Anti-globalization has intensified and spread, and the unilateralism and the protectionism has further risen. The global trade and investment environment had been seriously damaged, and there are some uh, charge holes for for uh, for exports, and the the sections tool had been used frequently, and um, the financial tools had been weaponized, and uh, the infrastructure and the security of the financial infrastructure have been questioned and tested. And in the G20 Leadership Conference summit, summit and the President Xi discussed about uh, what should we do in the future. And uh, he stated clearly that we should promote inclusive global development and resilient global development. From the historical side, the supply chain and the globalization will challenge it. But I think the uh, globalization of economy has, uh, has already gone to this uh, trend. And uh, the win-win situation and uh, collaborate, uh, collaboration are inevitable trend, and we should find the uh, 
breaking points for financial industries. And it's very crucial for us to maintain the stability and the co collaboration and a win-win situation. And I would like to propose several suggestions from the following aspects. The first is to improve the uh, the quality of financial services and also to break the bottleneck of uh, supply chain to uh, further open the uh, industrial chain and at the same time to increase the capability of the financial institutions to better serve the real economies. And at the same time, we should facilitate the international trade, uh, cross-border investment, and industrial deployments. And we should work in the following aspects. The first is more diversified services and products. And the financial uh, the financial tool uh, should be matched with the uh, investment, and at the same time to improve the efficiency and the convenience of uh, international trade and investment. And the second is improve the precision of the uh, sub of the financial services, and uh, to break the bottleneck in infrastructure and uh, to count uh, count uh, to. Uh, compensate the shortcomings, and the third one is uh, synchronization to support the leadership, uh, the leading companies and the core companies in the supply chain, but at the same time to satisfy the, uh, the to meet the uh, capital needs from the uh, SMEs, and the first one is to improve the working efficiencies, to combine. The finance with uh, technology and uh, use the technology to empower financial industries to provide more efficient and convenient services for financing. And the second point is to to promote the uh, low carbon economy and the green and the sustainable development. And in order to achieve the climate objectives. And the the financing scale for the uh, annual climate uh, climate change is around the four four hundred and fifty million U.S. dollar, and uh, it's the estimate that there is a, a great fund shortage, and uh, there are a lot of. Uh, Financing and the investment needs, and the financial institution should play its own role, and uh, uh, we should insist on the ESG philosophies. And to have a prudent evaluation for the social, environmental, and the labor force risks for the projects, and to build up at the end to gradually build up and complete our information disclosure system. And from the product point of view, we should uh, do a good job in developing an innovation for the green bonds, the green investments, and the green financial products, and so that we can in the properly satisfy the financial needs and the need for capital in the new fields, such as the carbon reduction and energy conservation and environmental production. And also another thing that is to uh, promote the connection between uh, the connection of these uh, kind of green credit centers and between different countries and to complete the policies to support the financial development. And the third is to lay a solid foundation for the financial security and to continue to develop our awareness and abilities for mitigating and preventing these risks and the potential hazards. Preventing the risk means to uh, it's actually a key task for the financial uh, for the financial work. And uh, alongside the situation that the global economy uh, recovery is a uh, pretty hard and and this kind of difficulty for the financial risk prevention is also developed. And I think it is pretty much m it's pretty much more urgent for us to properly control the risks. And how can we better control and limit the risk into a range that we can uh, we stand or we can take? And that is to say, it is a kind of key task for all financial institutions. The first thing is that we need to write properly, a build up our certain a, a certain mechanism for the risk preference, and to enhance our pressure uh, our pressure awareness, and to avoid the liquidity risk due to this kind of speculations. And on the other hand, that is, we should properly develop our abilities for risk identification, treatment, 
and with the help of the tradition, uh, with the help of the professional management mechanisms and uh, the technologies, and we should properly discover and prevent uh, these kind of potential risks, and to make this kind of a the plans and the schemes for the potential a kind of disadvantages in the future to prevent uh, the spreading of the risks. And the fourth part is to deepen our communication in the financial sector and to generate a joint force with our shared information, our mutual compensating advantages, and the joint development. And as for the fields, that is, we should work together to jointly help the high quality opening up to the world and to work on the green development and jointly construct the balance road. And as for the business, that is, we should give free play to this kind of differentiated advantages for different financial institutions so that we can provide, promote this kind of multiple level cooperation, that is, the policy-based develop policy development and commercial banks, and banking plus insurance plus funds, and to continue to innovate these cooperation modes. With the help with these modes of this banking conglomerate loans and the connection or the combination between these investments and loans and the cooperation between banks and the insurance agencies and the third-party market cooperation. And that is we properly provide a kind of portfolio for financial services. And as for information, we should not only enhance our communication in uh, enhancing our management uh, experiences and the risk prevention, but also uh, promote our information sharing in fine tech in this kind of inclusive finance and others. As for the mechanism, we should build up this kind of a normalized a cooperation mechanism and the network to create more convenient situations for the connection and cooperation between financial institutions. So, for example, in this official export credit, and the C and China Bank for Import and Export have actively participated in the large number of the cooperation mechanism with at home and abroad, and with the help of this a personnel exchange and experience sharing and information sharing. And we conduct these regular and spontaneous uh, negotiations and also the seminars focusing on the COVID-19, the RCEP, green finance, and other topics and have generated a pretty good outcome. Ladies and gentlemen, in this uh, report of the 20th CTC National Congress, uh, it's highlighted that we China have upholded the proper direction for the economic globalization and to promote and this facilitation and the, free, the freedom for trade and investments and to promote this multilateral, uh, bilateral and regional cooperation and to promote and to promote this inter international macroeconomic policy regulation, uh, policy coordination and to promote the construction for this kind of opening up world economy and to jointly create a kind of good environment for international development. And as, an, as a professional financial institution that is supporting this external trade and international cooperation for an economy, and the import and export bank is focusing on supporting the key fields, including the foreign trade, belt and road, modern industries, green finance, and inclusive finance. In recent years, in order to uh, face in this kind of uh, impacts f from the COVID-19 and also geopolitics uh, risks, and we have uh, give full play to this counter cycle and also this intercycle regulation, and have a uh, deployed more than trillion RMB for the loans in the foreign trade sector and to actively help with in the stability for the financial uh, for this kind of supply chain and industry chain. And in the future, in import and export Bank of China will continue to and go on the correct approach of this kind of uh, of this financial uh, of this politics financial banking institutions and to make our contributions to the Chinese modernization and the world economy. We will also give full play to our advantages and to deepen our practical cooperation with all aspects from the world and continue to develop and promote the depths and the ways for our cooperation and to jointly make more contributions to promoting the economic recovery and to maintaining the financial stability. Thank you very much. And that is, that is all for my speech today. Okay, so thank you very much, uh, Mr. Lee. And the next, let's have Mr. Ali Jahili, an ambassador, uh, ambassador to China from the United Arab Emirates.
distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen, good evening. First, Wang for his invitation to speak at this Financial Street Forum 2022 on a governance system and financial stability. Also, I extend my sincere congratulations to the organizers, noting that this mark marks the 30th year of the Beijing Financial Street and the 10th anniversary of the Financial Street Forum. Over the past decade, the Forum has built repetition as a permanent platform in China, as well as extending its reach internationally. This year's theme of development and security arising from global geoeconomic changes are timely and persistent. In the political report of the 20th CPC National Congress, President Xi repeatedly emphasized the importance of security, including financial security as a foundation for economic stability. For over 40 years, the UE has prioritized the development of the financial sector. Now, according to the United Nations Conference on Trade and Development, the UE is, is ranked first in the Arab world and, and the 15th globally in terms of our country's ability to attract foreign direct investment. As the leading financial hub in the Middle East and North Africa, the UAE strives to actively engage with the regional and global development schemes. As a recognition of our efforts in ensuring financial stability and long-term physical sustainability, the UAE participated in the G20 finance track this year. During President Xi's state visit, historical visit, in fact, in 2018, the bilateral relations between the UE and China were designated as a special comprehensive strategic partnership. Subsequently, the scope of our cooperation has broadened across many business sectors, cultural and people-to-people -people exchanges. The UE has emerged as an essential logistic hub of the Built and Road Initiative, a transit route for 60% of China's exports to West Asia and North Africa. Both UE and China banks are closely involved in their financial services facilitating this trade. So far, the UE has engaged in enormous critical global flagship uh, initiatives as a responsible global citizen. The UAE assisted in the launch of the pandemic fund to bridge pandemic prevention, preparedness, and response funding gaps. Moreover, the UAE has played a vital role in uh, agriculture innovation mission for ch climate aims to buy a rising investment in a sustainable, innovative, a global food and system that are resistant to climate change. As well as offers in food security and climate sustainability, the UE has played a major role in combating any threats to financial stability and security and, fin and facilitating the global economic recovery from the pandemic. Alongside the bilateral financial cooperation, the UE and China jointly cooperate on financial intelligence against money laundering and tourism financing. Ladies and gentlemen, I wish this forum every success as you address uh, making vigorous and determined endeavor for shared future economic development and financial cooperation under changes. As the world strives for economic recovery from the pandemic and faces other geopolitical challenges, the UE and China will send 
we will stand together. Thank you. Okay, so thank you very much, His Excellency, Mr. Ali Zahiri. And the next, let's have uh, Mr. Michael Spence online and he will uh, conduct a dialogue with a, the dean for a, the deputy chair of THUIFR. It's a great pleasure and honor today to have a chance to bring you a conversation with uh, Professor Michael Spence, the uh, 2001 Nobel laureate in economics and uh, one of the most distinguished economists in the world. Uh, Professor Spence, uh, thank you, and uh, it's great to have you here. It's great to be with you. Um, uh, which I just wish I were there in person. So, next year. Yeah. And and uh, you know we're we're uh, at this session of the twenty twenty two uh, financial district forum, and um, I will just give a, a brief intro about uh, Professor Spence before we start a conversation. Uh, Professor Spence is a senior fellow at Stanford University's Hoover Institution. He's also the Philip Knight Professor of Management Emeritus and a Dean Emeritus at the Stanford Graduate School of Business. He was a professor of economics and business administration at Harvard University, chairman of its economics department and the Dean of its Faculty of Arts and Sciences. Dr. Spence was elected as a fellow of the Econometric Society in 1962, 67, sorry, and a member of the American Academy of Arts and Sciences in 1983. And he also received the John Bate Clark Medal from the American Economics Association in 1981. I mean, I could uh, go on with Professor Spence's remarkable career and achievements, but for the sake of timing, uh, let me just say that um, it's a great uh, honor and truly wonderful to have Professor Spence here with us again. Uh, so I think this is now the first time that uh, uh, you and I were uh, having this dialogue for Financial District Forum. And thank you so much for your time and the support. Thank you, Jason. <clears throat> and uh, I want to just start with the big picture, um, you know, we're seeing this very dynamic moment of the world economy. Uh, we have this 40-year high inflation, rising interest rate. We have this war in uh, Europe and reversal of some aspects of globalization. And more importantly, you know, as you mentioned before, there's a shifting dynamics in the era of um, um, aging population. I was talking about the shifting labor dynamics. So uh, how should we really digest this um, pretty dynamic moment? Um, what are really different at this time? So I, I think the way I think about it, <clears throat> I mean, look, there's a lot of things going on. There's a really uh, consequential trends of the type you just mentioned. And then there's these huge transformations, you know, digital, life sciences, biomedical, and so on underway. So it's very easy to get sort of confused and lost. But I think, you know, focusing on the short to medium term, I, th I think the most important thing that, that I've tried to understand is a very rapid shift from a long period of, you know, deflationary forces that we associate with bringing vast quantities of unused productive resources into the global economy among developing countries and the emerging economies. And, uh, and now we find ourselves quite suddenly in a, 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 a supply constrained world as opposed to a demand constrained world. Um, and, and, and the reasons for that are several. One is this, we've ex kind of exhausted the, the, sorry, the deflationary effects that I just described are, are fading, right? We, you know, the relative to the size of global demand, we just don't have easily accessible and deployable quickly, uh, huge batches of supplies. So when we get a demand surge coming out of the pandemic, <clears throat> you know, which was expected, you know, we have healthy balance sheets, huge fiscal programs, accommodative monetary policy, and so on. The supply side isn't elastic enough. 
And so that, that's a major source of inflationary pressure. When you add to that aging in <clears throat> economies that account for more than 75% of the global economy, big shifts in the labor market, uh, you know, behavior um, over and above the, the uh, aging process. And then you have a, pr a process of diversification in a world that, you know, is full of shocks, pandemic, war, climate, geopolitical tensions and so on. And these, these uh, diversification efforts that companies and countries are undertaking with respect to the, you know, the where they're connected to the global the economy, are they're expensive, right? So, <clears throat> and then when you add the lingering effects of COVID, which is uh, familiar in China and so on, you, you basically just have a very different world. And, and, and so we have, uh, my best guess, and you know, we'll have to find out as we go forward, we have a world in which the we have inflationary pressures that are much more difficult to deal with uh, than in the past. I mean, we had accommodative monetary policy for the better part of 15 years and yeah. uh, and no inflation at all. In fact, we were below targets. That's just the complete opposite of what we're experiencing now. I suspect the real interest rates are going to be different. We're in the midst of a very large asset price reset in the downward direction, probably in part because of you know, higher real interest rates and higher discount rates and so on. I, I, it, the, the changes are so vast. I, I think it's a kind of regime change in the way the global economy works. And uh, I mean, in the center of this, I think we all have to admit is uh, what uh, the Federal Reserve uh, in the U.S. side, uh, they're doing to fight this inflation. I mean, um, they have to bring down the inflation. Right. They have a voice this uh repeatedly but um it seems still everybody cares about um how they really do this in a balancing manner basically to achieve a soft landing without you know really killing the economy and uh right. what, what are your thoughts there well you know the central banks have a very difficult problem i think this widely uh viewed without being excessively critical that you know they the the, there was a widespread belief that these blockages on the supply side were transitory. They would go away, um, which is a kind of polite way of saying we're going back to a regime that we that we had before. Um, and that and I think people have come to understand that that's not right. There are secular uh, changes in the global economy that have inflationary consequences. So they have a difficult challenge. Right. You know, if they could <clears throat> turn a dial and, and immediately adjust the inflation rate, then it would probably be a fairly simple task. But that that's not the way monetary policy works. And I'm not, you know, an expert in this, but in monetary policy is known to have variable and fairly long lags in terms of effect. So that, you know, if you just take the present day and, and a central bank like the Federal Reserve, you know, they don't really know whether they've done enough uh, to bring inflation down by knocking, you know, knocking aggregate demand down. Uh, and so if they, you know, if they decide they haven't done enough, uh, they may tank, you know, crater the economy. Um, if they decide that, you know, they, they, they need to do more, you know, it's just very hard to find that balance. In other words, you know, it, it's, a, it's, it's, uh, they're operating with imperfect information and imperfect forecasting ability. And they, you know, they could, they could fall off the edge in either way if they, if they do too little. Um, inflation will, you know, persist over a period of time that's longer than they they think is ideal. Um, they lose their credibility. Um, if they do too much, then we have negative consequences for the American economy and probably other economies as well. I mean, also on top of this, we are already seeing, you know, uh, Europe is is getting even into a worse situation, like you know, UK. They just right. entered this uh, recession phase. Uh, so, right. what's what's really unique there, and um, um, how is that sort of related to what we're having, you know, uh, worldwide? Well, so the European economy, you know, is is uh, subject to to more severe headwinds, right? Mainly uh, because of its um, lack of energy independence, right? It's heavily dependent. On uh, foreign sources of uh, of the least fossil fuels, um, and then you have the war in Ukraine, a huge uptick in the energy prices. You have uh, 
fiscal space that declined pretty much everywhere as a result of the pandemic. You know, big fiscal programs and in a rising interest rate environment and higher sovereign debt levels leave countries with less capacity to buffer the shock. Um, and this is a big shock. And when you combine that with sort of a slightly more fragile set of economies in Europe, and, and including especially the UK, which is kind of out there on on its own with uh, right. in the post Brexit period, um, then it's just very difficult. And inflation's just running out of control in Britain. Um, you know, when they try to buffer the shock, you know, the the markets react uh, negatively. Uh, you know, the Bank of England was forced to sort of change direction and start dealing with a kind of liquidity problem associated with, you know, uh, with uh, pension funds and sort of, you know, leveraged uh, investments in that in that area. And so it, it anyway, it's, it's just a, it's a more fragile situation. Um, and in 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 addition to all the things that are going on in the global economy, they you know, the, the European economies are dealing with the the kind of front line of the of the war in Ukraine. Yeah, I have to say, yeah, it, it's a fairly fairly challenging and complicated uh, situations. Uh, if you just you know look at the, what's happening in Europe and uh, and the U.S., but I want to I want to come back to uh, China a little bit. We just talk about this uh, new growth model with all this uh, new, new moving parts and the secular trends. I wonder. Uh, what do you think that will be the implications for for China, and um, what do you see as the key policy issues going forward for China's government to consider? Well, I think you know they China has a long history of you know very effective and you know skilled policy making. I think there was a kind of lull coming up to the Party Congress where you know we, there was uncertainty essentially in, in lots of quarters in the business community and the financial community about. What direction we're going and things seem much clearer now uh there's a clear statement <clears throat> on the question of addressing the imbalances and potential instability in the property sector uh there's a move in the direction of re relaxing the COVID restrictions <clears throat> which are a, a major you know headwind for the economy while they're still in place um and there's you know reassuring uh you know reassuring <clears throat> signals coming out about the importance of the you know one of the great strengths in the chinese economy which is the sort of science technology entrepreneurial side of the economy which is just thriving so i think you know probably we're still in for a, a difficult you know year year and a half here as the covid restrictions are lifted some of these uh, some of these issues like the property sector are dealt with um, but then I think, you know, with uh, with a kind of working relationship between the state on the one hand and the markets and the private sector on the other, I, I think things are looking pretty good. And China's been consistent um, throughout on the on two questions that are of great importance, I think. Uh, one is the um, the sort of reform and opening up of the financial sector, uh, which has not been disrupted, uh, you know, at really at all. Uh, over an extended period of time, and, and one expects that to go forward. Um, and second, China has remained committed to the notion that we have to sort of, you know, we have to adapt, but we have to maintain some version of a relatively open global economy. It may not be the same one we lived in before uh, because of the complexities associated with digital and other things, national security overlaps and so on. Um, but But having China committed to that and then finally i guess you know with a reasonably uh promising sounding meeting between president xi jinping and president biden and um and a kind of decent election result on the american side you could even hope i don't think you could count on but you could even hope for a rebalancing of the um of the relationship between the united states and china which uh which is of enormous importance you know in multiple dimensions, including especially climate change. I mean, I'm, I'm glad that uh, you you mentioned this word rebalancing. I think that's really like the key theme we see global wise, and also uh, regarding you know uh, the economic uh, transformation that China is going through. Uh, as you as you just pointed out, 
I, I was uh, I was excited when you know just two days ago, our central bank issued this a sixteen point plan to right. provide very significant support for the real estate sector's transformation. But that being said, I think everybody uh, agrees uh, there are still a significant amount of uh, uh, uncertainties and complexity. So um, I want to just zoom in on this financial safety and uh, security uh, concern, this central topic that you know repeatedly mentioned in the 20th Party Congress report. So right. going forward, um, what do you think should be like a key principles when we really uh, think about and also structure policies with this uh, financial safety and the security uh, in mind? Well, um, there's a kind of domestic version of that, and then a, and a, then a, and a foreign version. I mean, I think, for example, I mean to take the absolute, you know, most basic things. Uh, we cannot stay on the the trajectory, whether we're talking about China or the global economy, we can't stay on the trajectory that the debt levels relative to economic activity have been on. I mean, and and you you know you can say, well, that's fine. You know, we'll stop doing that. But you know, we have we have in the climate change area on a global basis something on the order of three trillion dollars of incremental investment to make. Uh, you know, the the sort of uh, easy way to go about doing that is to issue more debt. That's a pretty bad idea. So I think, you know, there's going to be more attention uh, in China and everywhere um, to, you know, A, making sure the investment programs are the ones that we need and have a high long-term, you know, economic and social return. And second, they're funded um, in to a substantial extent uh, by uh, essentially out of current savings. We're talking about rejiggering aggregate demand. Now that's easier in China than it is in other places because China is an outlier with respect to the, the investment level. So when you translate that into China, which I think what you want is a financial sector that is designed to make sure that the, um, the process of screening and, and uh, funding you know, investments is one that you know, screens out the bad ones and, and puts the good ones you know, on the board. I, I, I'm not pessimistic about that. I think in other parts of the world, there, there's a more difficult situation. There's a lot of emerging economies that are uh, facing dramatic headwinds and including potential fiscal and financial instability. And the, the global economy is going to have to deal with that. Uh, you know, we're, we're going to have restructurings and, you know, near defaults and, and so on. Uh, and so there's the potential. I don't think these rise to the level of huge amounts of systemic risk yet. Um, but if they're ignored, it could be pretty, um, pretty damaging on a wide swath in the global economy. So I'm not sure. I mean, these principles don't sound very new. I mean, it's just, you know, sure. kind of... But Financial fundamentals, I guess. Yeah, absolutely. And but you know, as, as you said many times before, and as many other people also, you know, agree, it's always you know the innovation part that's really are the core uh, for the growth. So you have yeah. been an avid observer about entrepreneurship and innovation around the world, um, including you know uh, China's digitization. You have a you have a Done lots of studies and uh, given lots of advices. So uh, I just want to, you know, hear again your current observation and uh, the prospect uh, in your eyes going for next, you know, year or two about well, it, innovation. It, so I, my view is that they, they, there's an extraordinary, you know, I mentioned these big transformations. You know, the di multi-dimensional digital one. There's a life sciences revolution underway. There's this huge energy transition. In in the global economy, we're seeing just an explosion of entrepreneurial activity associated with all three of these. Uh, and it's, it, you know, it wasn't all that long ago that this was highly concentrated in the global economy. The two major players in this, for reasons everybody can understand, big economies, heavy investment levels and so on are China and the United States. But it, but one of the things that's really intriguing is it's spreading. I mean, we have more of it in Europe now 
than <clears throat> we've had in the past. You know, multiple uh, multiple parts of Asia, lots of it in Latin America, starting in Africa. I mean, you know, it's just really quite extraordinary. So, and it's created by opportunities. It's created by powerful, you know, technologies and tools that are widely available. Um, so I think it's a, you know, it's a very important, you know, aspect of kind of hopefulness in the long-term future. It really is. Um, and I think, you know, there's a possibility that we'll get a surge in productivity, um, you know, from some of these technologies. There's a, at least a chance if we move aggressively um, that we'll have more sustainable patterns. There's aspects of the digital technologies that dramatically increase the inclusiveness of growth patterns, you know, by making essential services accessible to populations that have had difficulty accessing them. So there's, you know, there's lots of challenges in these transformations and they're always disruptive and there's always downside risks um, that have to be dealt with by regulation uh, and new principles like those that have to do with handling data and so on. But I mean, I, bottom line is, um, if we if we can get through the next two years without an accident, I think these longer term trends uh, are you know powerfully positive. And and I to be honest with you, I don't think even the present turbulence in the global economy is going to disrupt um, you disrupt this kind of outbreak of entrepreneurial activity. And so we'll have an asset price reset downward. That's you know that'll cause some turbulence. Uh, for sure, um, and and so on. So we've got to live live through a fair number of big changes and bumps on the road. Um, it'll feel at times like it's overwhelming, but but I think the longer term is really very positive. You know, Professor Spence, it's always you know very uh, encouraging to hear your views because you have always been an uh, optimist uh, and uh, having a. <laughs> A right. very positive outlook, uh, despite all the all the challenges in front of uh, you know us. So I want to I want to thank you again for for your uh, time and uh, tremendous support uh, for this forum. Uh, I think this is a this is the second, if not the third one, uh, um, uh, that uh, you are giving a speech for the forum, and we all really appreciate it your time and considerations. And uh, it's my personal hope that uh, next year we can really see you in person. Um, yep, no, I'd love to do this with you in person next year. Exactly. If, if you yeah. if you want me back, yeah. <laughs> That's what we, uh, we all want uh, to, um, to see happening next year. But uh, thank you so much again. Thank you, Jason. It's great, really yeah. great to be with you. Thank you, bye-bye. Bye-bye. Okay, thank you very much, uh, Mr. Spence, Spence, and thank you very much, Mr. Wei. Uh, ne next, let's come to the second session for today's forum. That is the launch for these financial uh, financial insurance, a legal secu uh, financial security network, a safety compl uh, legal compliance technology. The release of the white paper on finance and insurance cybersecurity complex technology. Let's have Mr. Zhou Dao Xu. Director Research Center for Finance Security of Tsinghua PPCSF to come to the stage and launch this white paper. Okay, so honorable leaders, dear guests, a good evening, everyone. I'm really glad to have this opportunity to launch our white paper for the finance and insurance cybersecurity compliance technology. And also thank you very much for your excellent speech. And also thank you very much for this excellent uh, in, uh, online uh, dialogue. And I think we have talked pretty much about uh, these finance security and also the safety. And I think uh, your discussion is pretty much uh, inspiring. So with the continuous growth for science and technology as well as the financial sector, the uh, security for science sci tech is also pretty much important. And we know that uh, it is actually an important part. And why we should launch this white paper today, I think 
they are all together for specific considerations. The first thing is that in uh, the situation for cybersecurity is not that positive right now. On one hand, we know that the frequently seen cyber attacks have imposed Im have imposed a huge influence and impact on the stability of the society and people's living. And on the other hand, and there have been a growing a threat of the new technologies and the new scenarios. And by the exploitation for the loopholes, and the cybersecurity is facing more attacks. And the second reason to our launch today is that so even if we have done pretty much in this kind of defend, the attackers may also try to avoid or try to bypass the firewalls and to attack the cyber system, especially for the finance and insurance sector, because our data is with much more value. The thing is that we are storing our account information and also the information for a capital, for stock, for behaviors, and social, inf and for social information within our uh, technical system. And that is why we are more chosen to be the target for our attack. So facing this kind of a uh, motivation for the interests, and we definitely become the target for cyber attacks. So the thing is that this is related with the attributes for the business and also for its data, because the financial sector is pretty much a uh, closely followed by the cyber security, and that is why we need to invest more in the protection against the cyber attacks. And the third reason is that the government and also uh, the requirements from the government and also these governing institutions and relevant departments, with the continuous uh, enacting and uh, the publishing for the relevant laws and regulations, including the law of cybersecurity and the law for personal information and privacy protection, and uh, the attribute of the financial sector have required us to further implement the requirements from the central governance agencies. And that is why these kind of techni technological compliance for uh, these uh, safety and security technology have become a new requirement for us. And the fourth reason is that the financial institutions are facing the challenges for the new round of infrastructure. And how can we realize in this kind of legal and regulation compliance? And how can we properly realize our target have become a current situation, have become an important question at a current point? And that is why we need to study, and that is why we need to publish this white paper. And now let's look at the key task, uh, the, the key content for today's white book. And I think for many of you, you have the white paper at your hand. And there are altogether three chapters. The first one is the overview for the cybersecurity of the insurance sector. The second is the overview for the network security protection. And the third will be the implementation and the advices to these implementation for uh, this kind of scatter-based or the grade-based protection. The reason that we specifically separated these kind of insurance sector here is that uh, the banking sector is with a pretty good reserve and pretty good foundation for the cybersecurity. But the insurance sector has been developing constantly over the years. It is still pretty much a, a in a shortage compared with the banking sector. That is why we need to study this cybersecurity issue for the insurance sector. Okay. Now this is the first part for our white paper. That is a short overview. That is. A a, a shorter description in the cyber environment that we are facing. So uh, as of the year 2021, the scale for China's digital economy has reached 45.5 trillion, and we have become the second largest digital economy. And also at the same time, and the technical innovation have, on the one hand, bring us with a, a kind of convenience, but on the other hand, it also brings a pretty much vulnerabilities. And with a, the a generalized application of the digital technology, have bring about new challenges for cybersecurity. And the third is that it is driven by interests. 
So driven by the interest, the target for cyber attack is much more precise, and they are more focusing on the higher valued articles. So that is the overall situation for cyber threats. And from the, our industry itself, and we, a, our core competence needs to be improved. The first is that we need to have a kind of overview and a coordinated development for both online and offline security. So the core to the security is that we need to have a general picture for both online and offline. That is, we should not only guarantee the online security, online cybersecurity, but also this smooth operation for the economy offline. Entering this digital era, and the high level and the, the high level or the highly risky uh, sustainable attacks are more and more frequent. And that is why the normalized security management have become the core. And a third is the application for the innovative technology. And these kind of intelligent or active defense or the security operation will become the key factor that determines uh, the safety management. And the third will be driven by the laws and regulations regarding this legal sector. And the first one is the, the law for these kind of legal uh, for the network security, and also in this kind of law for inf personal information protection, and also and this implementation manual for the cybersecurity in China. And also, we have some regulations from, from these uh, SAC, uh, uh, sorry, from these a. Uh, committee for these governance, for banking, and also the insurance sector. And all of these requires these it requires us to enhance our protection for the cybersecurity. That is the first part of today's launch event. And now let's move on to the second part. And the second part we'll be talking about the major tasks for this classified protection of cybersecurity. That is, a, we talked a short uh, about a, this a protection mechanism and also the, comprehe uh, the, the comprehensive a kind of a classified protection mechanism and a comprehensive defense mechanism, the safety management center, the safety management technical system. And uh, about the center, we talk about the safe, uh, the, the secured communication networks, a smart, smart, a secured margins, secured computing environment, and secured management mechanism. And the targets for the classified production includes the Internet Information System Cloud Platform, mobile internet, IoT, and industrial con controlling system and the big data. So the classified protection for cybersecurity is an important, a fundamental national policy that, is, that the CPC Central Committee and the State Council have decided to implement. And it is also a fundamental mechanism and an important measure for us to realize the protection for the important network information system and also the, uh, these data resources. And we believe that it is a kind of necessity for us. And what are the positive advantages that it will bring to us? The first one is that if we mitigate the cybersecurity risks and to increase these kind of general security protection abilities, the second is that it meets the requirements from the laws and the regulations for the state, the industry, and these management and supervisory uh, institutions. And the third is that it protects the security for and the important information system that is closely related with the fundamentals of the nation. And of course, is that we can comprehensively develop this kind of awareness for cybersecurity. And the last part in this white paper is how to implement the uh, cybersecurity protection. And uh, there are five steps. The first is definition, second is registration, and the third one is adjustment, and the fourth one is valuation and grading, and the last one is uh, supervision and monitoring. And the protection compliance is a set of security system construction. While the market environment is changeable, the network attacks may occur at any time, and the attack and defense confrontation is, uh, should be normalized. Therefore, the last step of compliance work is to achieve daily security management and real-time operation so that to deal with the, the normalized network attacks. And there are five steps such as a screening, testing, training, consolidation, and emergency response. 
and the training is also very essential. So this is the main context of the white paper. Thank you for your attention. Thank you, Mr. Joe. Thank you for your sharing. And uh, just now, we have learned the contents of the white paper. And uh, uh, he mentioned that the uh, and uh, some um, people uh, focus on uh, attacks of the uh, the uh, financial securities, and uh, is related to the uh, state securities. And the compliance is very. Inf important issues and in the digital economy and um, uh, the financial industry should improve the infrastructure at the same time to develop the uh, digitalized uh, economies and to, to build a more comprehensive digital uh, di digital economies and uh, I believe that the white paper will bring more benefits to the financial industries. And next, please allow me to invite our panelists to come to stage. They are Zhou Daoxu, Mr. Zhang Jianhua, Mr. Xiu Jun, and uh, Mr. Luo Decheng, and Ms. Ma Xiaolan. Please kindly come to the stage. Distinguished guest, ladies and gentlemen, good evening. And I am the moderator for the uh, roundtable discussion. And uh, in the first session, we focus on the financial securities. And our six speakers share their thoughts on this uh, topic. And uh, now let's proceed into the uh, roundtable discussion. And the roundtable discussions are also about this theme. And first, please allow me to introduce our panelists with us, with us today. Mr. Zhou, Mr. Zhang Jianhua, Director, Research Center for Financial Development and uh, RECTIC, Tsinghua PBC SF. Mr. Xiu Jun, Senior Expert at the Vice Chairman, Investment Committee, CDB Finance Co. Limited. Ms. Ma Xiaolan, CEO, Beijing Financial Security Industrial Park. And uh, I would like to invite each of our panelists to express your opinion on this uh, topic. And uh, I, maybe I give floor to Mr. Zhang first. And uh, I was very honored to be invited to attend this uh, forum. And this, uh, the forum is about financial development and financial security. And uh, I benefit from the uh, previous speaker's presentations. And they have discussed the uh, domestic situation and the global situations. And uh, I would like to talk some uh, detailed aspects. I would like to talk about the uh, data security and how to apply the data and to dig the value of data. And uh, because we uh, we are in the digital era and uh, the financial institution are accelerating the transformation on the digitalization and the massive data are used in financial institutions. And a lot of data are not, trend, are not conventional and a lot of data are from our daily life. And uh, just now, um, 
on, during the issuing of the white paper, and uh, there are a lot of social data, behavior data, and they are not conventional data. And uh, this uh, this uh, volume of the data are huge, and for financial institutions. And uh, maybe in the past, it's, it, it was very difficult for us to dig the value of the data. But right now, with the advanced technologies, and uh, we believe that we should dig the value and make use of the data. Uh, so the data security and the data protection and the data applications are connected. And there, we should find that balance point from the uh, three aspects, how to protect the, the uh, people's uh, privacy and at the same time the use data. And um, and uh, the, the law has uh, come into effective, like uh, a data protection law. And uh, the uh, central bank also issued the relative, uh, relevant uh, uh, legitimate. Uh, but there are still some uh, details, implement, uh, implement, Im implementation issues, and to find the value of the data. And uh, data are the protection uh, production af uh, factors. And uh, for protection factors, it comes with uh, some uh, features. And when you use the data, the value of the data can be amplified. So data is not like land. It's not like human resources. It's not like capital. And the main differences is, and uh, we said the uh, frequent use of the data, the value of the data will increase. But for traditional protection factors, we said the use of the land, the use of the human resources, sometimes the value decreases and uh, the value depreciations. And uh, say capital, you use the capital, you use money. But um, for data, the value actually increases with the use of the data. And similar with the human resources, Say if you use the labor for three years and it goes the life cycle is three years less, so with the big data, with the more usage of data, the value of the data increases. And uh, there's some issue of the uh, use right of the data, and because I, I, I used to work in two commercial banks. And uh, I have a very close uh, relations with uh, financial institutions. And we will deal with uh, the um, the privacy, so deal with the private uh, information. We always think about how to improve the uh, value of the information at the same time to protect the, uh, the people's information. So under the, the legal framework, I think they uh, we can use the data properly. And we just think about how to use the, uh, how to dig the value of the data, and uh, to achieve the data transformation eventually, and at the same time to 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 achieve the uh, financial development, and uh, who masters the data, and uh, who can make use of the data, and uh, who master the future. So we should get rid of the uh, the unconventional tools and kind of conventional ways, and we should think about how to use of the data. Well, there will be some uh, risks, but uh, you cannot dig the data just because of the risks. And at the same time, you should think about some uh, tools, some uh, ways. Well, some people may think that the the right of the data, the the right the right of data should be only um, mastered or only managed under one or two institutions. That is not right, and we think about how to make use of data and also to do some maybe transaction of the data. 
so that it can help us to do the digital transformation. Because the base of the transformation is data, it's not technology. Because without data, the technology is useless. So this is my main point. Thank you, Mr. Zhang, and thank you for your sharing. And uh, his idea is data is a protection factor, but it's a different ways of the traditional production factors, and it can be used uh, re repeatedly. And uh, secondly, and uh, he talked about the, uh, the some conflicts be, yeah, with the use of the data, and uh, I agree with him. And uh, there's, a, there's some conflict between the big data and the small data, because uh, the massive data is very useful. And the second is the application and the mining of the data. Uh, he mentioned about the uh, uh, we need to protect the privacy of the data, but at the same time, we should uh, dig the use of the data. And the third one is as a protection factors. The data should be distributed and should it be processed. And how to distribute, how to distribute data and how to process data are the issue that confronted us. And uh, next, I will give the floor to Mr. Xiu Jun and to share with us your thoughts on this. And just now, several speakers present their speeches. And I benefit a lot personally. And um, around this topic, I have some thoughts. And in the 20th National Congress, the conflict is the um, imbalance of the development and the ideal of people. And uh, a lot of uh, SMEs were the uh, some startups, and they have uh, high demands for from uh, financial industries. They have some uh, capital needs, and uh, entrepreneurship, and are very important for us. No. Okay, so in recent years, due to the overlapping of the inf of the influence from the COVID-19 pandemic and also this a uh, kind of international conflicts, and also this economic downturn, these uh, contradictions have become more prominent, which have led to huge impacts to the economic development. So uh, we can see that the contradictions for China's financial system is not only domestic but also international, and such a kind of uh, contradiction is not only used to these financial stability, but also this overall mechanism. So if we cannot properly deal with the supply issue, then the contradiction cannot be avoided. According to the national uh, the deployment and the requirements of the central government, that uh, our system should properly help with the real economic development that takes the market as the entity. And for the governance, we need to have this coordinated force of the supervision of the services and the management. And to better mobilize the financial sector to, to help with the real economic development. And how can we solve this issue? I think it is a key to solve the problem and also to help us to realize a, the proper improvement. And actually, this regulation is in the hands or in the control of, the gov of these uh, governance organs. And as for the supervision part, that we need to set up a bottom line and also to properly solve the problem in this management of the shadow banking and other issues. And that is to prevent this kind of spinning and also this excessive fluctuation or expansion for the, uh, for the financial institutions. And uh, just now we have talked pretty much about this, man uh, this uh, management. And on a basis of that, we need to make a, we need to do a better job in management. That is, we should not only prevent, but also look at how to solve or mitigate those issues. 
So the thing is, how can we properly lower the cost for financing for enterprises and to increase the proportion for direct investments and to better serve the enterprises? And just now, in the, as our guests have mentioned, we have many SMEs in the import sector. So are there any imp enough measures to help with the innovative development for the SMEs? This is actually a key task and a generalized question for us. And under the current situation, there have been uh, there have been a more prominent issue for the financing difficulties for the private enterprises. So from the mic macroeconomic point of view, that is the leverage rate, leverage ratio for China's financial market is pretty high. And that is why the banks, they cannot easily issue their loans. And actually, right, we know that uh, if we want to the enterprises to start, and then we have uh, jointly launched these kind of a, a policy portfolio of the three arrows. And also, there are altogether 16 articles for these uh, for the for the financing and uh, for the financing of the housing market and to trying to solve the problem of the excessive leverage ratio. So these targets, right? A uh, we would like to start from the three a uh, red lines and all the way until the three arrows for the market. And it is reflecting the, conf the contradiction between the reality and the governance sector. It is not only these, uh, not only the limitation, but also the weapon for that. And generally speaking, our devel the development of our financial system is far from being mature, far from maturity, right? Because the money is not properly is not properly uh, allocated. And even though there is a Nobel Prize laureate, he cannot uh, have a full grasp of the China's issue. So the thing is that uh, we have an excessive rate for these uh, excessive ratio for leverage. And uh, the fund, they would like to uh, lead, uh, they would like to go to some a kind of like the trust or some kind of guarantee issues for uh, those listed companies, and that have been criticized pretty much. So that is why uh, these uh, these funds have been seen in various as aspects. So although that after the launch of the, uh, of various uh, new regulations, and how can we properly use our tools? to mitigate the financial risk. It is a thing that we need to look at. And when facing these kind of innovation, uh, we have a number of the innovations uh, or the institutions that uh, with a smaller or medium size are facing these kind of difficulties. And this is also an active uh, in the uh, actual example for uh, that and also the, the 20th CPC National uh, Congress reports have mentioned that we need to enhance our guarantee system to guarantee the stability for the finance, uh, for the financial system. And also, it specifically mentioned that we need to and enhance and to improve the functions for the capital market, and that is also really important for that. So on a basis that we build up a kind of mechanism that the financial sector supports in the, the optimal development. And that is why, or that is how we can ensure and guarantee the proper development of that. Okay, so thank you very much for your excellent sharing. And I, from my understanding, I think the thing is that and the resources should be properly allocated to the more effective ways. And that is we need to properly help with the development of the private and also this innovative economy. So only if we can have a kind of real economic development, then the financial sector will be secured, or otherwise it will be far from security. So real economy is detailed and is connected with the, real, with the finance sector. And today we also have one panelist named Luo, Mr. Luo. And Mr. Luo, and we know that uh, due to some factors, he cannot come to the state, come to the stage, and he has specifically recorded a video. So let's give him several minutes to play the video from Mr. Luo Ducheng. To Financial Street Forum in Beijing. First, I'd like to congratulate the organizers on the 30th anniversary of the establishment of the financial street that deepens global exchange on the development of the financial markets. 
historic changes have been achieved to make China's financial market world-class in the last three decades. No doubt, stemming from tireless work of the Beijing Financial Street Organization, setting standards, regulating and modernizing China's financial markets and infrastructure. Important international forums such as this inspire and spark further conversations about how the global financial markets are evolving. As we know, markets are now changing even more rapidly. Again, I offer my heartiest congratulations and wish this forum more success in the subsequent years ahead. I'm here today very honored to join this conference to provide my view on some recent events affecting investors around the world based on my experience in Asia asset management after over 30 years in the industry. We are witnessing unprecedented challenges to globalization that has defined the global economy since the latter part of the 20th century. Countries are increasingly focused on national and economic security in the face of geopolitical uncertainty. The rapid rise of inflation and interest rates from major central banks, as well as weakened reports of GDP from the Eurozone, emerging economies, and the uncertain growth of the US pose challenges to capital markets. These tensions have given rise to increasingly segregated practices of deglobalization that hinder growth, hamper global supply chains, and hence adversely affect economic activities. At Invesco, we believe that the integration and cooperation of trade and investments are correlated. So geographic, industry, and security goals can be achieved together. However, we believe international cooperation of trade and investments remains a superior model than widespread deglobalization, which could usher in a deflationary period for trade surplus economies like China, while likely cause stagflation for trade deficit countries such as the United States. Global investors are well informed and possess strong analytical tools to evaluate markets. They will size portfolio exposures relative to perceived risks. Reducing political tensions through open dialogue and mutual trust would undoubtedly improve market stability and boast investor confidence. Indeed, we believe any effort by global regulators to alleviate, alleviate such tensions would likely be rewarded through increased capital flows. China's unwavering commitment to liberalize the capital markets has been a great attraction to global capital markets seeking growth, opportunities, and have formed the basis of this market confidence. We all know that Business confidence is essential for stable and sound economic growth. It is also a critical element in investing. So boasting confidence among investors and business communities require well-coordinated and articulated policies and regulation. When business operating environment is clear and stable, stock markets can operate efficiently. Due to China's long-term commitment to ongoing financial reforms and to open its markets, global investors have viewed China as a unique opportunity for diversification and high growth opportunities across various industries for decades. In recent times, China has further advanced its economic transformation and growth by becoming a leader in areas such as environmental, social, and governance, ESG investing. 
as one of the largest issuers of green bonds, China plays a leading role in international efforts on sustainable finance and decarbonization. The world is awakening to the rise of green finance as an important building block to control the warming of the earth. China is playing an eminent, eminent role by co-chairing the G20 Sustainable Finance Working Group and developing the G20 Roadmap. We watch with much interest to see how China's national climate policies like 3060 dual carbon goals, one plus N climate framework, and launch of the world's largest emissions trading scheme continues to drive China's decarbonization and net zero pathways. The biggest global shift to renewable energy in traditional emitting sectors has begun in China. We see accelerating decarbonization effort will significantly transform and drive the growth of China's economy going forward. At the same time, it also opens significant ESG investing opportunities to global investors. ESG is an area with shared global concern and common stakes. However, our experience tells us that the ESG standards and perspectives can vary widely. Dialogues and collaboration are therefore foundations to addressing differences and seeking common goals. In this regard, we view ESG as a potent area in which can open up avenues of investment opportunities with many different possibilities and options as companies transform and develop viable and profitable strategies. On this note, Invesco and our joint venture, Invesco Great Wall have significantly established a strategic long-term partnership with Tsinghua University to research net zero transition in carbon intensive industries in China. In fact, the first research report in collaboration with Tsinghua on such net zero transitions outlined three major industries has been released. We believe the research findings will help contribute to China's pursuit of sustainable and high quality growth in the coming decades. We also see opportunities for global cooperation in public markets. Today, Many Chinese companies list their shares on globally accessible public exchanges, bringing China investment opportunities to the doorstep of global investors. Tomorrow, we hope to see also more global companies tapping into China's vibrant capital markets. Harmonizing financial information, sharing practices can help improve investment transparency and investor protection. To this end, we are encouraged to see continuous dialogue and progress being made between the CSRC and the SEC, enabling Chinese companies to be dual listed in the US, boasting Chinese companies' visibility, credibility, and access to capital in Western markets. By identifying common objectives, we all can benefit the greater good, helping investors and companies grow capital. Much is to be achieved in a mutually beneficial way. Closer to our expertise in asset management, I'd like to share one more example of potential common ground. Like many other countries, China's dem demographics are changing rapidly. A robust and comprehensive pension system plays a critical role in funding retirement needs. In the context of China, the private pension is urgently needed to ensure financial security and stability for the country's elderly population. Drawing upon our decades of international experience and lessons learned can help shorten the path of development. China's market for asset management 
continues to evolve for the benefit of the Chinese investors. Global asset managers can play a critical role to bringing innovative solutions to help develop the markets so that the Chinese retirees can choose from a wider selection of best-in-class managers, securing Chinese retirees' retirement nest eggs. Going forward, I think we will see more formal regulations to enhance market functioning and facilitate more investments in the capital markets. Consistency and transparency are also key aspects to keep financial markets running smoothly in our view. I imagine we will continue to see increasing quotas on the various Connect programs to bolster the current stock and bond Connect ones and the QFE schemes. I'm excited to witness the continued reforms that provide financial structure, security both domestically and internationally. We're living in a time where new rules are being written and the future of our economies might look very different than in the past. However, we should also celebrate the fact that we have a once in a lifetime opportunity to witness and participate in China's capital market transformation. As we build this new future together, let us embrace the opportunities that lie ahead of us as we build a safe, stable, and prosperous world. Thank you, Mr. Law. And, uh, and he mentioned about this is the 30 years anniversary of a financial street. And uh, Mr. Liu also mentioned about this. So he's very familiar with the, the uh, financial street. And uh, he also talked about the uncertainties, such as uh, inflation and the tension and the slowdown of the economy growth and how to improve the financial security. And so we should uh, mitigate fin uh, inflation and back to the world economy, back to stabilization. And uh, through the uh, orders and uh, norms of G20 and uh, the uh, stable Chinese market will facilitate a global, a stable uh, world economy. And he mentioned about the domestic security and international security uh, uh, synchronized. And uh, his topic is very relevant. And then next, I will give a floor to Ms. Ma Xiaolan and to share her thoughts with us. As a distinguished guest, good evening. And it's my honor to to be here today, and I also benefited from uh, the previous speakers. And uh, I'm a practitioner in financial security, and also um, I'm a surveyor uh, in financial security and financial industry. And I would like to say that financial security is a national strategy, and uh, it has been mentioned uh, numerously in the uh, national 20th National Congress. And the presidency said that state security is the foundation for our rejuvenization. And uh, since the, the 18th National Congress, financial security is integral of uh, state security. And uh, financial security is part of uh, the state security. And um, I'm very honored to be here, and I would like to thank the uh, Xichun District and uh, Beijing Municipal Government because uh, since 2015, and they are very look, uh, forward looking and uh, set up the uh, uh, Beijing Financial Security Industrial Park. And I am the operator and the investor 
for the industrial park, and it has been seven years since its, its establishment. And um, I have developed a better understanding of the uh, the uh, the system of financial security uh, since the reform and the opening up, and uh, we have developed a, a fair large financial uh, market. And from the openings of the uh, of the uh, of this market, and uh, and in the past, our efficiency was not good, and it's only driven by the government capability. And uh, now we have to rely on the innovation of the financial institution. And um, this is a foundation for innovation. And uh, during the past several years, we have served the real economy, and uh, we should form four financial securities aspects. The first is the uh, fundamental technologies, and it I includes the uh, advanced uh, standards, infrastructures, operational system chips and uh, credibility uh, innovation innovative products so that we can better serve the uh, financial industry and bring more applications and uh, there are some um, industrial cluster in our industrial park and uh, second is Based on the uh, deployment of the financial space, it's part of the uh, infrastructure of financial services, financial securities. And the third one is uh, ecological aspects, the big data, uh, IoT, cloud, cloud computing, AI, and uh, all of these are advanced technologies, and how to integrate them with the financial industries. Uh, it it uh, solidify the foundation of financial securities. And it helps us to maintain a healthy development of, um, of a financial industry. And the first aspect is application. And with uh, the advancement of the technology, our financial service quality has been improved. And how to come back to real economy, how to facilitate the inclusive finance, and how to protect the low carbon economies in low carbon industries is something that we need to work with. We need to work on. And this is very essential for us. And for the past several years, the, uh, there are 900 companies in industrial parks. And uh, some of them are in advanced technologies, some of them in fintech. Uh, digitalization tech, and they have formed an ecosystem. And uh, in the 14 to 5 years plan, and we would like to enhance the high quality development for the finance industry in Beijing. And we would like to build five highlands. First is a technology highland. Second is talents. And the third one is ecosystem. Fourth one is a uh, technical highland, and uh, which laid a solid foundation for achieving the modernization in China. And uh, as a practitioner in financial security, I would like to contribute my own effort in this area. So this is my sharing. I would like to upgrade the uh, financial service, the financial industry in the coming years. Thank you, Ms. Ma. Thank you for your sharing. And uh, I'm, maybe this is your first time to hear the name of uh, Financial Industry Park because uh, I work in this uh, field and uh, I have visited the uh, industrial park several times in Fengshan District. 
and uh, there are some uh, very good foundation in the financial ser financial securities, and uh, we're looking forward to the uh, future deployments in the future. And uh, we just uh, wrap up with our first uh, rounds of uh, table discussion, and uh, next. I would like to read some specific questions to our three speakers. And it, you may briefly answer you answer the questions. And from macro economies level, and in G20 Leadership Summit, and the President Xi talk about how to serve, how to uh, how to mitigate the uh, inflation and how to contribute to the uh, Chinese effort and the Chinese wisdom. And uh, the uh, second is the um, the uh, pandemic prevention measurements issued by the State Council. Uh, will it bring some implication to the financial securities and how to mitigate the financial risk? How to adapt to the new forms and the new norms? And you may talk about your ideas. Maybe we start from uh, Mr. Zhang. So talk about the uh, data application and the data securities. I think the, for uh, the capture of the data starts from the capture of the data. And especially for the uh, personal data, is this a legal? And the procedure is very important because we talk about how to uh, apply the data, but uh, how to use it without breaking the law is uh, the important issue. And uh, so, how to process and uh, and uh, classify the data is all happened after the capture of the data. And there's something that um, that you cannot control. This is now to the essential stage. And another essential stage is the application of the data. In order to maintain the data security, I think the first is uh, all verification. And you have some disclosure obligation. You need to disclose what information that you would like to collect. And some for some applications, and they and they collect the data at at a maximum, maximum, and they collect a lot of unrelated data. In the regarding this aspect, it is also under the governance for MIIT and the Office for the Cybersecurity Management. And uh, in the later phase, when we cooperate with the financial organizations, the thing that we need to do is that we need to do a good job in this personal credit information management. Because we know that the credit information is involved with some process and the analysis, and that is why we need to uh, have all those a uh, kind of credit agencies or credit institutions in China that they need to uh, be licensed to operate in that. And about the system, right, about providing this information, uh, about the fundamental or the basic information, do they have to get uh, be licensed? It is a question needs uh, our di uh, discussion. So what are the, uh, the, the sensitive information and what are the regular or ordinary information? Only by looking into that can we better uh, know about it. Uh, know about its operability. So uh, if you talk pretty much about the macro point of view, but you cannot go in deep, uh, then that is right. Uh, that will largely influence our overall performance. So we need to look at the specific issue. So one example is that we know that in the consumer finance sector, it is an important sector in the future. And the wide sense a uh, consume, consuming goods I think a, the large amount, the amount will be as much as 17 trillion RMB. But for many of them, they are gradually moving towards a, the kind of digital handling and the digital process. So many information are already processed online, and they are realized by the digital ways. So if you cannot clarify or cannot clearly distinguish like these data liabilities and also the, these data authorities, and you class or you consider that all these various information are 
in this kind of a credit system and only open to the licensed institution, then this may lead to a huge issue because uh, those agencies, they are uh, not that much in scale. And uh, if you write, if you look into that and you consider all those as a kind of part of the limited institution, then it will be pretty much restricted. And so the first thing is that it should be properly captured and in its usage, it should be properly authorized. So if that is not a information that is pretty much sensitive, so can we briefly leave uh, the barrier? Can we briefly you know, raise the barrier for that? And uh, many of the times we know that uh, this uh, personal credit information is pretty much widely used, even if in case of employment or looking into the credit scores. Okay, so uh, the scorecard for the credit. And uh, so for us, we like to look at how can we better implement that or put that on the stage and to promote our digital reformation. That will be also the key. Okay, so uh, Mr. Zhang is actually is an expert in the financial data, and I think uh, he reminded us with an important issue, that is in uh, the PBOC and also in the, these a uh, and these a uh, CBRC, right? Have actually a uh, increased its punishment in the data violation. So the things include, for example, the first one that is this kind of excessive data collection, and also this excessive data uh, use, and also ex and also this violation, uh, that is the illegal a uh, publishing or is illegal exposure for the data, or and uh, to trust to the third party data companies which did not properly ensure the privacy of the consumers. So in the past, we know that many uh, financial practi practi practitioners will look into the market or the credit risks. But in the next step, our practitioners should also look into the risks of data. So I think uh, just now uh, your idea or your, yeah, uh, your comments have been really much important for us in mitigating the data risks. OK, so uh, let's ask Mr. Xu to, connect it, uh, to, to continue his comments. The thing is that we know that uh, in China, actually, uh, about the proportion for financing, I think China have always been pretty low. And in recent years, the number have been around 30 to 40 percent, while the number in the United States is around 90 percent. And about Germany, Japan, where they are pretty similar to China, and they are still at the level for about 60 to uh, 70 percent, uh, percentage points. That is why our financial risk will be pretty much centralized in the banking system. So for such a high rate for that, high rate of loan or high rate of debt, is pretty much impossible for an enterprise to uh, give to have their own finance. And the total M2, right, at the end of 2021 is about, uh, is, is, is about like as high as 300, uh, more than 300 trillion. So its ratio, the ratio from M2 to GDP is higher than two, and that is the highest in China. And the leverage ratio for financial institution, uh, financial enterprises is about 161. And according to the OECD, the safety, uh, the safety threshold is about 90. So we are far exceeding the threshold. That is why the enterprises are locating in a kind of a dangerous or hazardous uh, situation. That is, they are with an excessively high rate for that. So the thing is that if we can properly increase the level of uh, increase the ratio or the level of the f of the funding, will be really vital for us, and it will be really important for us to adjust our economic structure and to build up into a new development pattern, especially under the sharp changes for geopolitics in the world. And China should also look into its own development for the industry. And the thing is that we don't have enough uh, self on the capital stocks and the lack in innovation momentum. These are the questions that need to be solved. And I think uh, as for these aspects, many advanced economies in and the world have also paved or walked the same way. And I think here, that is where we can learn from the experiences for, from the other countries, such as the United States. And in the year 1950s, uh, the United States have listed uh, this plan that is to provide the long-term uh, equity funds or equity financing for SMEs. And the Fed have a 
also made the dedicated regulation. And as for us, as for me, I think I've went, I've been to Stanford University for uh, exploration and for visiting. So as early as the year 2000, uh, the government institution accounts for about 23% of the all ventures, uh, venture capitals uh, in the United States. And that is why uh, we say that the government, U.S. government have actually nurtured or incubated their venture, uh, their, their venture. And uh, about uh, another institution is these uh, is uh, these uh, bankings? Is the banking of uh, Germany? I believe we are pretty much familiar, right? That is this uh, KFW, right? And the KFW is actually a, a targeting at providing these kind of supports for the revitalization and development and reconstruction for Germany. And this KFW banking group, and according to the needs for economic development, they have shifted their focus to the financing for the SMEs. And they have accounted for about a half of its total volume for its economy. And that is how it can guarantee that these innovation capabilities of Germany is world leading. And for this aspect, China have also made pretty much efforts to that. And the thing is that we believe, right, it is a kind of policy measure, policy based on measures. So in the past, there have long been a kind of dispute or a, con or a kind of discussion on whether the banks are able to conduct their, uh, their investments. And uh, back then, right, we know that we don't have enough amount of the capital in the year 1992. And the many state-owned enterprises, they are with pretty much loans or pretty much debts. And that is why we started our, uh, we started a, our reformation of the state-owned enterprises and set up these financial asset management companies. And these have properly solved the problem of financing for uh, direct financing for the SOEs and have also laid an important foundation for going listed for the SOEs. And after that, our Chinese SOEs can be fully unleashed and then go to being listed. And another thing is the establishment of the specific uh, dedicated debt in the year 2015. So back then, uh, it was it was actually uh, this kind of uh, suffering from a kind of economic downturn, and the central government had have uh, specifically allowed in uh, these a uh, CDB and to issue this kind of debt to raise the capital for the projects. And these a uh, fundraising part will be the dedicated a uh, dedicated debt while the investment end will be the infrastructure. So that is how or why the uh, banking can be considered as a kind of capital capital source. And especially in this year, uh, facing the economic downturn. And the State Council have taken this infrastructure fund as a specific a uh, driven force for that. And as early as June, uh, the State Council have decided to uh, use to, to mobilize 300 billion as a kind of dedicated debt to work as a kind of capital fund. And later on, the number doubled. And later, this import and export bank have participated and joined in that. And so actually, the thing is that we taken this capital fund as a kind of guidance. And we have also got our preconditions or historical experiences of guiding the market with, a, with that. And more importantly, we have mentioned that about the Chinese government. And uh, the, in 2015, the State Council issued that we allow those, uh, the setting of the dedicated fund to lead the high attack industry development. And as for the end of the year 2020, we have set up about 2,000 government-led funds, with as a total scale for about 12 trillion. And I think the number, uh, the number or the proportion of the government is around one quarter. And these have played an important role in a, helping with the development of the regional economy. But as a just a, as the previous panelists have just mentioned, after right after a, the the launch or the publishing of these regulations, right in order to prevent the risk, it is pretty much like we dropped pretty much of that, and we dropped the opportunities together with dropping the risks. So. A, not only the financial institutions, but also many PE and VCs are sh in shortage of their capital. 
So that is why we are in an urgent need for financial reformation. So to sum up, uh, in order to help with the new development pattern and to properly solve the problem that the lack of capital hinders or prevents or precludes in this momentum for investment. I think that is why we need to have carry out the reformation. And recently, there is a rumor that all the provinces and the cities are in a negative growth. And in this aspect, I think the financial institutions should enhance and their uh, support to real economy, especially the direct investments. And I think for this for this aspect, it have already we already have pretty much appeal in the international in the international academic se sector, and that is we should right try to make some new breakthroughs and to do some equity business. And just as as I have mentioned, there have been pretty much experiences in other countries, and our uh, financial institutions are with the abilities of that. And uh, as we have mentioned, many of these uh, specific debts have been invested in the high tech sector. But actually, we have made pretty much work or made pretty much efforts. That is, uh, such as these kind of a uh, funds for a uh, for these uh, or the national a uh, credit endorsed and these a uh, state uh, this Ministry of Finance and have led have led that. So basically, from here, we say that these policy-based finance services is gradually moving from the traditional sectors to the new SciTech sector and to promote the national economic development. We can see that it is a trend, not only a trend, but also a focus after the 20th CPC National Congress, especially this policy-based policy or the politics-based banking. And uh, just as uh, President Lee have mentioned, it is actually an investment that is a long term or countering it is uh, or countering those a uh, kind of terms. So the thing is that right we don't have to uh, have that much of a month. And the thing is that right uh, basically we can have like about two hundred percent or four hundred percent, but not about ten hundred percent. So these national fundamental funds can be further can play a more important role for the regulation and adjustments for the macro economy and this upgrading for the economy and for the economic sectors. So basically, we uh, suggested that we can have the pilot project in some regions and in some banking sectors. We believe that if we on uh, this reformation for the financial institutions will be the uh, focus for the next step. And uh, yeah, I think that is all for my, my sharing. So thank you very much for the excellent uh, sharing for Mr. Xu. And that is a uh, from the CDB. And I think he has uh, pretty much a unique understanding of, of that. And that is to lower and, and that is to supplement this capital and to lower this leverage ratio so that they can combine that with a, the debts and also this equity. And now let's have a Madame Ma to share his her ideas. I think I would like to talk from how financial industry can help real economies. And I would like to talk from the uh, financial innovation. I think the real economy has very close connection with the financial industries. And uh, the SMEs are seeking for capital. And uh, some of them are very difficult to finance. And uh, the risk management is also very difficult for SMEs. So how, if we don't solve these uh, two issues, it's very difficult for financial industry to help real economies. And when we construct the uh, financial industries, the digital foundation and the digital base is is very important. And uh, how to integrate the finance, technology, and the digital. And it's like the uh, cybersecurity white paper that we issued today. And to how to develop the uh, security for in insurance industry. And uh, so for us, I think uh, we need to integrate with uh, the technology base. And uh, the uh, technology base also connects 
it has the uh, connectivity functions. And in order to transform, to, to, in order to do the digitalization transformation and uh, te technological transformation, I think in the past, uh, the connectivity was not strong. And uh, now we should be open to the uh, regulate, uh, regulator. And also, we, we need to obtain more public information. And uh, we should be more open to the uh, whole life cycle of the uh, enterprises to, to build a dynamic chain for the enterprises. So data security, cyber security, information securities are very important. So this is the uh, starting point for the innovation. So with, if we waste this foundation, and in Beijing, since the 35 years plan, and Beijing has achieved uh, fundamental changes. And we have uh, set up a Beijing transaction exchange. And um, this is uh, this platform opened to high precision companies and, and uh, uh, technical uh, startups. And at the same time, we establish the uh, financial course. And uh, the financial function is an important functionality for Beijing. And this is also the focus of the 45 years plan. And Beijing is also only city with the two zones, the uh, safety zones and the free trade zones. So this is called two zones construction, which include over one, 100 financial innovations. And uh, in a service zone, it includes all, over 46 financial securities functionalities. So this is the uh, policy support for building Beijing as a financial center in China. And during the digitalization, and uh, it requires the technical support and also requires the uh, precise profiling of the companies. And the companies need to finance, and the uh, government need to optimize the business environment. And the government should help the market to develop, rather than intervene the uh, the market frequently. So it can help the financial industry to build a solid foundation. And uh, with all that, we're going to implement the details after the 20th National Congress and to achieve the uh, modern China and to build a safe, healthy, innovative framework in the future. As a representative from SMEs and uh, as someone working in the private sector, and I hope that we can uh, accelerate the uh, innovation in financial industry. And at the same time, to capture the necessary data, to analyze data, and to, to produce a, a precise profiling. And in the future, is the uh, we in order to provide a precise uh, financial services for a specific industries, I believe this is very necessary. And Beijing has done amazing jobs. And um, there, Beijing set up the uh, service platform for SMEs and the big data bureaus. Uh, big data bureaus has published a lot of the tax and the legal data, regulatory data. This is very transparent. And if it can help the uh, financial industry and the banking sectors. They don't need to set up their own big data platform. 
And this is also the spirit from 20th National Congress to share together, to benefit together. Because for some companies, they are not capable to do the digitalized transformation. And we'll think about how to integrate them and how to ensure the, uh, the safety of the supply chain. And uh, this all due to the uh, foundation of the uh, financial securities. It's uh, like the base of uh, building a house. Because uh, we need to integrate the financial security as uh, the base. It's like the, your electricity system in your own home. And when there is some leakage of the electricity, it will send signals. And we should build the comprehensive modern frameworks. And we also need to innovate in algorithm to better serve the industry. And another aspect is the procedure securities. And uh, there are a lot of government bureaus and the listed companies. And they also face the issue of uh, data securities and the cyber securities. And in the future, and they need to focus on the uh, enhancing the data security and the cyber security. And uh, another point is the operations security. Operational security, we should improve the innovation of the financial sector. I think it brings great implication to Beijing and also to other cities. It built a uh, great example for other cities. Thank you, Ms. Ma. Thank you for your sharing. And uh, the previous speakers shared from the supply side. And uh, Ms. Ma talked from the uh, demand side and from Party B. And uh, Party B thought is the pinpoint is the demand of the market and is something we need to address and it's the uh, direction that we need to work to and uh, if we can solve the uh, pain point we can boost the profitability so because so for the sake of time I have to wrap up I would like to thank all the panelists for your sharing and um, the um, your sharing have, have been very enlightening, and the security is a precondition for development. Financial security affects the uh, nation national security, and it's an important strategy of the nation. And no matter how the geopolitical change, surrounded by President Xi, and uh, we should stabilize the development of financial security and to help the real economy to develop. And I personally, I enjoy the night a lot. And I would like to thank PBCSF. Thank you for giving us the opportunity to, to learn from the experts. And thank you for sharing. And thank you for organizing. And uh, this is the end of the panel discussion. Thank you for your presence.